Um, it is my understanding that this is not being live streamed. Is that correct? That is correct, Janine. It is not being live streamed. Okay. Recording, and we will upload to YouTube and Longmont Public Media. All righty. Um, as far as roll call, um, I, I will run through who I have here. Please, if you will say I or here uh, to confirm that. Sarah, Mary, mm -hmm. uh, Susan, Aaron, here. Michelle, Priga. Here. here. <laughs> um, myself, Janine Karen, time here. Jack. Here. And um, Art Quintana. Here. Uh, Michelle Wade. She's here. Here. She's here. I, <laughs> and uh, Marsha Martin. Here. Uh, do we have any guests that I'm, I didn't record? I don't think so. Okay. Um, just in review of uh, protocol uh, for any voting, um, we'll do that by raise of hands. Uh, you know, to notify us if you are leaving and re-entering the meeting. Um, all righty. Public is invited to be heard, but we have no public this morning. Uh, has everyone had the opportunity to review uh, minutes from last meeting? And if so, are there any corrections? It looked good to me. Okay, do I hear a motion to accept I'll it. meeting? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I did, I did. You did. Sarah, no, Sarah, no. I, I move to accept them. Thank you. Okay. Jack seconded. Jack seconded. Thank you. Uh, old business uh, report for staff regarding accessing, accessing city services. Michelle? Yes, so thank you. Hi, everybody. Please, Good morning. Please, please Hi. <laughs> Um, so we have put together trainings for the city. The city has a training program called CLU, which stands for City of Longmont University. And Brandy in particular has put together a couple of different trainings that we have put through the CLU program, um, most specifically on dementia. And it was part of a countywide effort around being dementia friendly. And so she's had really, I think, pretty good response about doing that. Um, we also opened up our Medicare basics classes and our advanced directive classes to city employees and they could get clue credits for those programs. So we have an opportunity to do a customer service sort of approach um, and possibly do that maybe in conjunction with our youth services staff that looks at a broader customer service piece to address some of the concerns that I think Susan and others have raised around um, serving people uh, with who may not be able to hear, who may not be so technologically savvy, et cetera. So we're um, pursuing that, as you might guess, some of our training programs right now with the city, with the closures and the restrictions, we're not going gangbusters, but we are doing some things. So Brandy and I have talked about that and we're moving that forward. I did add an item under new business that I think might give us some more information. And I'm curious to have that discussion before Brandy and I move this uh, any further. So one of the questions we have um, is, uh, is this an appropriate training provided that we can get it through the CLUE approval process that any of you would also like to be a part of as a trainer, like co-train with Brandy? 
So that's kind of the question to the board um, about how we move forward with this. So. Question, Michelle, would you explain what the CLU approval is? The clue, so there is actually a board of regents of made up of city employees and you can propose a training class and that board decides whether or not it's appropriate or not. So there is an, a, an approval process and it's made up of city employees. Thank you. You bet. Michelle, what does that volunteering curtail actually? You know, Janina, it's a great question. I think Brandy has a pretty good handle on the format for a class, but I think it would be co-presenting and being available for questions and any follow-up that attendees may want to, to ask about. I think it, it helps to have an older adult be a part of a training and serving older adults. That's sort of my thinking on that. So if it's uh, co-hosting and being available for questions and feedback, I, you know, I would be interested. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Susan, I'm going to have Brandy catch up with you, okay? Is that all right? Yeah, it would depend on schedules and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I mean, like, that's a big interest of mine. Right. I think it's got some great potential. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other thoughts? When we get to the item under new business, I think it will have some fun with this. So. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is comments regarding sustainability handouts. First of all, did everybody get the handouts, the packet? I did. It, it was quite lengthy. Jack, I don't know if you want to do a kind of a summary opening or what you need from the board with regard to that. And Marsha, I know you've also been very involved in the sustainability and some of the climate action work. But if there is some specific feedback that would be helpful from the board, um, now's your time. Well, most of the meetings, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, mm -hmm. most of the meetings are pretty lengthy and a chock full of information, but maybe I'll try to summarize what's important and maybe we give you one page. Is that fair? Works for me. I think what's, what's most important is if there's something coming, uh, something the board needs to know about, some input from the board regarding sustainability and the city's work in this area. Um, this is a great opportunity to use the board for some feedback. Okay. Try to do that for, before next meeting. Okay. Marcia, do you have any, you know, updates at least from your perspective and your involvement? Um, um, well, you know, I, I um, am not able to go to the sustainability board meetings, even though I would, um, just as a member of the public, uh, because I have a conflict with a board meeting that I really am the liaison to. So um, I don't get to know what they are thinking. Um, I'm thinking that I'm going to play hooky uh, at the next LDDA board meeting and, uh, and go to the sustainability board uh, just because I was puzzled by some of their responses to the um, uh, Climate Action Task Force recommendations. Um, they seemed to be the most conservative of all the review boards in terms of what they thought uh, could be done, uh, which I found surprising. Um, I, uh, uh, I understand the, the necessity for maintaining social equity as we go through big changes like this, um, but it wouldn't be an emergency if we didn't 
if we allowed the social equity requirements to stop things from happening, they need to change the way they are implemented, but they shouldn't be a barrier. And I feel like we maybe could have um, some input into that, you know, in, in terms of let's look at this in terms of enabling communities with special needs um, rather than um, assuming that special needs are a roadblock. So that's, that's my general feeling about it, but uh, I don't have any specific examples. All right, any feedback from what you read of the materials that uh, were sent to you that you wanna offer to Jack right now? Uh, anybody else? I, I need to be honest that one, that was a huge packet of information and I did not review it um, before uh, the meeting today. So I don't have input for that reason. I, whenever they produce things, they do produce it in large volumes. And so sometimes for me, getting through it and completely understanding it um, can sometimes be a challenge. So I'm just being honest about that. I understand it's a challenge for me also. We're really glad you're going to those meetings, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> but good news, okay. this past meeting, we had some difficulties and I did not go to the meeting. So, and I have not received the, uh, the, the notes, but the, uh, there was another meeting that took place for the state, and uh, it has to do with uh, greenhouse gases, pollution reduction road roadmap, and there there's only a few notes, so when my time comes, I could discuss what was right. taking place at that right. particular meeting. But the state does preempt local thing. So I think it's important to think about what the state has to say about sustainability because that's where the money comes from and that's where the political cloud comes from. So that's something to consider. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any other comments regarding that? Moving on uh, to uh, on old business to other, does anyone else have any other old business? Sarah? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure this fits in at this point in the agenda. Tell me. Uh, I had a few uh, things I wanted to mention about the current state of the census. You want me to do that now? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, as of the end of August, um, Colorado's um, return um, status is that 68.3% of households have responded. Um, we are at least 10 percent percentage points ahead of Wyoming and Montana, which are the other two states in our region. So we're doing pretty well. Um, but I wanted to encourage you, if there is anybody among your acquaintance who you feel has not responded or might not have responded, please urge them to do so. The um, collection of data uh, for the general census will end on, the, on September 30th. So there's just this month left respond. Um, the Census Bureau's outreach people, they call mobile assistance people, um, are going around to locations like groceries, library, uh, school districts that might be open uh, for in-person attendance and so forth to do outreach to people at those locations. There's also available to 501c3 organizations um, $1,000 grants 
this month, the applications must be submitted by um, September 15th to specifically um, do outreach in rural areas. I don't think that we count um, that anybody from Longmont would be likely to uh, apply now for one of those Insta grants to do outreach. But if you know of somebody that might, um, please ask for further information about that or uh, recommend to them that they do apply. Then there's one other thing that I uh, wanted to mention, according to the Census Bureau's uh, weekly update, um, in-person visits or at homes where they've had no response are going on now. And it is possible that you will get an in-person visit, um, even though you've already responded online or in, by phone or mail otherwise. And uh, they don't want people to be upset about that possibility if somebody comes knocking on your door. The most, this had not occurred to me, but the most frequent reason for those visits would be that there was some discrepancy in the address that what you reported when you responded to the questionnaire was a different address than what they had on their records from post, post office, uh, local um, government authorities and so forth and all of the sources that they uh, used before the count to know which places they should be counting and they have to resolve that discrepancy. So I guess the word is, please be nice to the, the uh, person who might knock on your door and uh, understand why they might need to ask you a few more questions. You know, they, they do a um, um, quality assurance um, check. I don't know what percentage of the home visits or for that purpose, but for those two reasons, you might, you know, somebody calling at your door. And it, in my case, if they rang the doorbell, I would be so shocked because it hasn't been rung more than once or twice since March. So um, anyway, any questions about any of that? Sarah, do you think that, um we should put something in one of our regular emails that's coming out and and both the Spanish and the English emails. And should we emphasize that the, the, the door knock piece or should we emphasize you can still call? In? What do you think the emphasis should be, I guess is really my question. Well, I think it would be great to do that. And I think the major emphasis is do it this month, do it because as of September 30th, you know, the time is up. Okay. And you might just say that there are some special, you know, you know I don't know how to, um, we might just say if you have already responded, there might be some question that the Census Bureau has about your address and that might cause them to send a person to your door to uh, try to clarify that problem. So in addition to getting folks who haven't completed the census, somebody might knock on your door with follow-up questions. Yeah, something like that. But it would not be very common, but don't be. I, yeah, I worry about opening the door there for scammers, you know? Yeah. Um, it might be better just to encourage people to respond. Yeah, I can check with Carmen and Aaron to see if they've got something ready to go um, about that. But really what you want to emphasize is the September 30th deadline. Kind yes. Of. Okay. All right. I can do that. Sarah, a question I have is, uh, I mean, 80, I know good and well we would love to have 100% on this. But is 86% a fairly good number compared to the past, or where are we at on that? 
Actually, it's 68. Oh, I thought I heard 86. I'm sorry. I was really excited. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know the specific numbers, but my impression is that given the difficulties with um, the lockdown and so forth, that um, 68 is pretty good, especially compared to other states in our region. Okay. Well, I was like I said, I thought I heard 86. I said, wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah, well, not quite that great. All right. Thank you. That was all. But I think it's an excellent idea to put a reminder in the newsletter. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, moving on to Janine, did something change? Your voice is very garbled. No, I, I, I didn't change anything. Um, I'm not sure what, what I should do. Let's see. I'm, I'm going, going to mute you and then come, come back on. on. See. Is, is that, that any better? better? No. no. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe she should leave the meeting and come back in. I don't know. Yeah, Janine, why don't you try maybe leaving the meeting and coming back in? Or alternatively, if you have a pair of headphones, maybe that you could plug in. Very strange that it was working and then not working all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I, I will uh, leave the meeting and, and come back. And then come, come back in. Yeah, you have a little Darth Vader going on there, Janine, so. Well. <laughs> okay, bye. We'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Isn't technology fun? No, it is not fun. Especially if you're ignorant, it's tough. <clears throat> I had an old laptop at home that I was, uh, it says it was a city laptop that I was using, but it had no microphone or camera capabilities and it could not. So um, all of the meetings I was participating in from home I had to use the chat function to give any input. And I know that some of my colleagues really appreciated that because it muted me to some degree. <laughs> but uh, but Robin got me a, a new camera and uh, now, now I don't have that anymore. So I get to fully participate. All right, Janine, you're back. Am I back? Can you oh, hear me now? I? Yes. No more Darth great. Vader. No well, I'll tell you what, my cat walked by. I don't know, maybe she has some bad karma this morning. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, we can't see busy. you, Janine. Huh? Your camera's not hooked up. Oh, well. I want to see you. You want to see me? Yay. <laughs> okay. Um, October agenda item proposal. So this has my name on it, but Sarah, you might be able to lend some input here. Carrie mm -hmm. Middleton works for Boulder County Area, G Area Agency on Aging. And I understand she did a session with the County Aging Advisory Committee on ageism, changing the narrative. Mm -hmm. And she is available if that is something this board would like her to come and present and participate, it is about an hour and a half uh, commitment. So it would be the majority of your October or other board meeting should you decide to do that. Um, so Sarah, why don't you jump in and talk about your experience and what you think. Okay, um, I think it might be very good. Um, we're in the middle of a three part uh, discussion of this issue at the Area Aging Council. 
Friday is our next meeting and this will be stage two of the discussion. And there were some things that, from uh, the earlier discussion and the, um, the preview of the, the meeting on Friday that I was gonna share on my report. But um, there's one thing that I would like to read, which might give you some food for thought about whether it would be a good idea to do this. And she sent out, um, as part of a packet for our Friday meeting, uh, about four or five different, just without comment, things that she wanted us to, to take a look at and uh, hope they might trigger some thoughts. Most of those were greeting cards that are uh, offensive to older people. Uh, and actually the ones that she sent were not nearly as bad as many of the ones that you see at the supermarket. But anyway, this is uh, just a brief statement and I'd like to just read it and then get response, see what you think about this. I don't know the source of this. I don't know anything about it other than this brief statement. Would you know Colorado's state budget pays for essential services like education, public safety, and our transportation system that define our daily quality of life? Unfortunately, our aging population and a series of amendments, which we've made to our constitution over the last several decades, have created a fiscal conflict within our state budget that's eroding our ability to sustain that quality of life, unquote. Any comments? I have a comment. I think right now, um, our state, uh, our communities, uh, all of us are experiencing so many challenges in so many ways that, um, you know, diving into this kind of endeavor at this particular point in time um, is probably something that I wouldn't do. I would really put it on the back burner because, you know, I'm thinking about day-to-day <laughs> -day living challenges um, and that's just my opinion. For me, it's not a priority right, right this minute, right now. Well, let me t tell you what I took from this little statement and what I think the point was. Um, at the second sentence says, unfortunately, our aging population and then constitutional amendments have created a fiscal conflict. And it sounds to me like whoever um, said this, and I'd be willing to bet a lot of money it was the legislator, um, is saying that, you know, blame it on our aging population. The fact that they're making it hard, that we are making it hard for maintenance of a good quality of life. So I think the point was that ageism is not necessarily the annoying, ostensible things like offensive greeting cards and um, other uh, things that indicate disrespect to older people, um, but a lot of our assumptions about what government should be doing or not doing, um, are, include an assumption that America, or that in our society right now, older people are getting uh, more than their share or that they are causing problems rather than contributing to the overall good. 
So I, I think that although the first installment of our um, discussion at the triple or uh, AAC was somewhat superficial. The second one coming up, I think, is going to dive into more of these uh, subtle ways that the aging population is not included as a positive part of our society. That makes any sense. I'm sorry that I'm, you know that this has come up during the middle of our discussion because I might be able to. Sorry about that. My phone is ringing. We will ignore it. Um, I might be able after Friday to give you more information about what she would present. So I think you know the. Oh, go ahead, Marcia. Oh no, go ahead, Michelle. You do you first. I think to Janine's point, you know, as we look at things like racism, racism in the moment versus systemic racism, um, I think that that ageism um, is also that. Um, it is also in the moment when I hear somebody talk about that darn senior, which is a phrase I just can't abide. Um, and then the policies and the things that become more systemic that are ageist, it, it's both and. And I, I am curious at Carrie's approach to changing the narrative around racism and what is that, and I mean around ageism, um, and what does that mean? Um, and I heard it had good response at the AAC. I don't know where it goes other than I feel like it needed a beginning. Um, and it may influence what we do in terms of our customer service approach and some of the things, how we present the Longmont Senior Center. One of the things that um, now clearly after seven months is, um, we're going to have to reposition the Longmont Senior Center. We're going to have to re reposition us um, and what we do. And is there an opportunity in this sort of a, a rebirth or a reopening or a repositioning that this information might help us really look at and do something better? Um, and different. So uh, I, I appreciate there is a lot going on in the world right now. Um, and we're all sort of being asked to look inward and outward in terms of our relationship to what's going on in the world. Um, so I, I appreciate, Sarah, your, your, your example of the cards versus policy, um, because it is, it is both and and lots in between. Uh, for sure. Um, oh, sorry. sorry, do you need to respond to Michelle? Because I had a different take on it. Well, yeah, I would like to respond to what you said, or what uh, Michelle said. And maybe we should broaden our discussion to include those other um, isms that you mentioned. Because I think there's a lot of commonality that we don't think about. And uh, the last interchange I had with Carrie, which was just brief, was that the important issue for me is that first the dignity of an individual should be the key and that we should not be lumping people together as old people or as specific religious or racial or ethnic group or any other group, subgroup within our society as being the important distinction about that person. And so, you know, it could be we should have a broader discussion that would include ageism, but other things. That's what I wanted to comment. I think that's true. The thing that I wanted to say was, um, it's important not to not to 
first throw the baby out with the bathwater because the um, the statement about the fiscal constraints we're under is true. And what the last legislature did to try to mitigate it was put a Gallagher amendment repeal on the ballot, which would allow, um, which would allow the state to more realistically balance the value of the different assets that the state has in terms of, of private property. Um, because right now, um, you know, the, the real value of our um, uh, residential property has exceeded the real value of, of our, or has proportionately increased in respect, with respect to the real value of our industrial property. And um, that has distorted our tax base in a way that's very difficult for, uh, <laughs> makes it difficult for government to operate. Um, but the other part of it is that that, as a legislature would tend to do, um, focuses on uh, the liability of the aged in, te in terms of there is a segment like in any other segment that is in demographic segment that's needy, um, and there's a segment that has special needs, which is true of every demographic segment. Um, but they're ignoring the asset and, and uh, you know, what, what we have found in Longmont since older adults have been uh, less visible in the community uh, than before uh, because of quarantining themselves or self-isolation is that uh, we can't get along without us, you know. I mean, we're, we're big volunteers, we're big donors because we've, most of us have achieved financial security um, and are in a phase of life where we're considering giving back. And I think it is important to emphasize that in any messaging about this demographic. I think that that, that is one major point of what Carrie is trying to do and in her reframing exercise is try to emphasize the positive role of older people in our society and also to make it clear that <laughs> you might not be an older person today, but if you're lucky, you will be <laughs> in the far off future. And that we're all in this together is one of the important points to remember. It might be that October, and I guess I'm thinking about right before the election, might not be the most fruitful time to take on a philosophical discussion like this. But that, <clears throat> um, it, it, I, I think that it's one that in the future we can have. Jack, you were gonna say something? Yes, I was. Uh, there's an overriding factor to everything we're saying. Um, COVID has put a lot of people out of work, several million. So that means monies from taxes are not flowing into the central budget of the federal government. And those monies are distributed down through states, counties, and cities. And unfortunately, those monies are becoming less and less as COVID gets worse and worse. And there is a political aspect to some of this, but I don't want to discuss the political part. And uh, I think we have to think about the future. Uh, traveling in the service all over, I think we have a great senior center. I'm not saying that because you're present. It happens to be a fact. And we're fortunate as a senior, reaching my 80th birthday, I always thought I was real young, but that's uh, not true anymore. But the point is, uh, that's gonna be an overriding factor with what we can do because your budget at the senior center is going to depend upon monies coming down through the city via the state, via the county. And unfortunately, some of those monies might be less and less as time goes on, unless we find the vaccine to do away with COVID. And uh, I just feel this is always an overriding factor for the near future. Bothers me, but there's not much I can do about it. I 
have something I think is important to share at this point. Um, I had an appointment actually with my um, physician and was discussing uh, COVID vaccine and how that's going to be dispensed and priority and so forth. And he would share with me, uh, and he is very active with um, public health organizations that seniors should probably be aware of the fact that although they are at highest risk, that they may not necessarily be the priority group uh, to receive vaccine first. And I was um, kind of shocked and taken aback by that. But I do think <laughs> that that is an older adult issue um, that is really very acute right now. Uh, and probably gets my focus, you know, maybe more than parts. Um, so, uh, you know, perhaps that's something everyone can be thinking about and looking at is there anything that we need to do ahead of time or any statements we need to be making or, you know, do we pursue anything in and around that uh, particular issue? That's it. May I make sure. one more um, reference to Perry's material? And this is part of the PowerPoint that was sent out to us in advance of Friday's meeting. Um, this is a slide called Reframing Vulnerability. And instead of talking about seniors as um, needy or victims of whatever policy you're talking about, that <clears throat> reframing would be emphasizing interconnectedness and our responsibilities to each other, regardless of age or um, specific uh, situation that the individual has. And um, <clears throat> he suggests that we avoid labels that suggest weakness or separation from society. And the first example in the PowerPoint is reframing language about COVID-19. Instead of talking about you know, that society as a whole sacrificing for people who really need it, that is older people or people in nursing homes or some other assumed to be weak part of the population, that we explain how we can prepare for everyone's health situation and talk about the, the reality of the virus for everybody. Um, <clears throat> while we all stay home today, we see fewer new cases tomorrow. By keeping our physical distance, we slow the spread. This protects those who are most at risk and the availability of the life-saving healthcare we all depend on. In other words, not by pointing out that those old folks in nursing homes that we're responsible to take care of and sacrifice for. Hmm. So anyway. Um, so my, my, um, temperature read on this subject is that um, it does generate a lot of conversation and difference of uh, thought, which is wonderful, but perhaps not October. Is that so for not October, is that if you would nod your head yes or a thumbs up, not October. Okay. Do you want it, this uh, presentation and this conversation sometime in the future? Yes, but not October. Okay, all right. So Sarah, maybe um, you and I could talk offline. I could talk to Carrie and we'll see what, what makes sense. 
Could I make one more <clears throat> comment about my, uh, my thought that we should try to integrate this discussion about ageism into a broader topic of how to treat everybody in our society more fairly and, with, and give everybody more dignity. I got a questionnaire a survey from my political party and excuse me, Jack, I was gonna mention politics. Then I'll not mention the party, but I think everybody knows where I am. Um, and they wanted me to list, you know, there were seven or so, six or seven different uh, concerns about, you know, what should be done to make our, our country better. And this was sent, I got it yesterday, or yeah, Monday, I think. Racism was not in that list. And I have been, well, first I was angry and I was astounded. And I, you know, how can, you know, a major political party in my, my very own, which I love, you know, be thinking about, gee, what do we need to do to make our country better on the 1st of September and not even include that in the list of choices about your concerns. So I think it is essential for us to be talking as a, any time we can get together with a group of our fellow persons, we need to be taking into account you know, what's happening to the society in terms of how we treat other people and how other people treat us and whatever subgroup we may belong to. That's, that's why I think the discussion is really important. Thank you. Thank you for letting me rant there for a bit. <laughs> it's, um, it's been quite interesting for me um, because I turned 60 last year. And I don't have much gray hair, but I certainly have acquired quite a bit in the last five months, let me tell you. But um, how many people seem surprised at my age? And I am quite, I'm really, really okay with saying I'm, I'm an older adult now, I'm 60, and I feel kind of excited about that, you know? Um, and how many people are like, oh, no, no, you can't be. And um, it, is, it is offensive in a different way. Like, I don't know. I can't explain it. Ages I agree. I'll age. be 70 in a year. And do people say, oh, my gosh, you don't look 70? It's like ageism comes in lots of different ways. And, uh, and so, like, I see gray hair, white hair, I'm ready for it. You know, I yeah. see my mom, her, and, but anyways, it's interesting. It's interesting how it plays out. I will talk to Carrie. I will put this further out and uh, I appreciate the conversation today. And um, I think this is a conversation that's gonna keep happening and um, at a national level, certainly, um, the isms are gonna continue to get addressed, hopefully. That'd be my wish, all of them. Okay. Does anyone have anything else that they would like to share on this subject? Okay. Um, moving on, we need to discuss uh, reopening, identifying concerns, restrictions. Um, so here's kind of where we're at. Public health is now, uh, you have, in addition to doing a proposal to our city manager and, and my boss, Karen, uh, we also have to do a proposal to Boulder County Public Health, and they will do a walkthrough of the senior center. Um, generally speaking, this is where I'm headed, which is a possible November 2nd opening, possible, uh, with registered activities only. So we might do, for example, a drop-in shuffleboard 
um, but there would only be four people who could come and play and they would have to sign up ahead of time. So they would have to register for a drop-in activity. Or it could be a film that the staff have planned and you still have to register and the chairs would be six feet apart, that kind of thing. So um, we're looking at opening from nine to three as a possibility or nine to four, something along those lines. And we would only be using the gym and rooms D and E for um, activities. <clears throat> um, we are continuing to do the one-on-one -on -one with staff and customers uh, for basic needs. This would be wellness, recreational, educational kinds of activities. Um, Meals on Wheels is going to continue to do home delivered only at least through the end of the year. And so the dining room would be off limits. Uh, we would restrict access to the dining room and the commercial kitchen for sure um, if, we, if we opened in November. We would have health checks. We would have people come in through the front door, do the health check, temperature check, direct people to the room they're registered for, and we would have everyone exit out the east entrance. We would not serve coffee or refreshments for anything, but people would certainly be allowed to bring their own water bottles. Um, and then a snack, uh, which is especially important if you have something like diabetes or, or another health issue that you really, you really do need to have some food sustenance. Um, quick question. Are our water fountains down like they are every other place? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, you could fill a water bottle in the little kitchen, but the water fountains will be out of commission. Um, so that's kind of a general approach we're taking. Um, in our proposal, which we have not submitted yet, but it does include regular sanitizing of um, before and after every activity. So we have to make sure that we have staff and custodial staff available to do that. We are not looking at opening up Lashley Street Station. This is really about the senior center, reopening the senior center for some activities. Um, the go, the fall go is getting ready. Uh, we're in the last edits now. Um, and all of the programs are going to be virtual. But if we can do some hybrid activities in November, we will do that part vir vir virtual and part in person. Um, so this is the beginning. We are still safer at home. Um, because the majority of the folks who come here are over 65, public health may say, yeah, no, you're not opening November 2nd. Um, Do you know of any senior centers in Colorado that have opened? Yes. Yes. And in Boulder County. Lafayette Senior Center is doing <coughs> some, activities. some activities. Pardon me. But Boulder is not open yet. Louisville is not open yet though they are also writing some reopening plans. Brighton is not open. I just got their newsletter today. They are not opening at all. Michelle, I've been thinking, contemplating, you know, about what I can, what I can do to help. And I'm wondering if, um, if volunteering to help with sanitizing or greeting people or taking temperatures if extra staff is needed that I am certainly available to volunteer Thanks, uh, and to help in that area and I'm wondering if, mm -hmm. if volunteerism at the senior center is would even be considered. 
Yeah, and that's that's a great point and something I could weave in and at least, you know, have a conversation with public health and uh, with the city leadership about that. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Jack, did you have something? Yes. Uh, Michelle, are the uh, sports like shuffleboard and the films, are each person going to have like a number of things going to be staggered so everyone gets an equal shot at playing shuffleboard or coming to see a film? So Robin has worked out uh, within our current registration system, and it would be at this point first come, first serve, but we could do that. So I have a couple of questions. One is, what is the, do you look at it from like the maximum number of people who would be in the building at the same time? And then that's kind of how you're coordinating or, yeah, anyway, that's one. And then the other is prioritizing, like I think with all the isolation that people have been enduring, you know, what are the highest return kind of activities that, you know, you guys could could initiate or open up early on that would maximize, you know, the minimal number of activities that would maximize, you know, the kind of getting people back on track. Great, great, great point. So one of the things is we would not do activities like cards, which are about sharing the face cards. We would try to pick activities that there was no sharing Mm -hmm. um, we have talked about picking a mix of activities. So a shuffleboard versus a film versus exercise. So we have some variety mm -hmm. of things, but probably we are doing two things in the morning and two things in the afternoon that's, and that's it. That's what I was curious about. Yeah. We have to really use the bigger spaces, the gym and the, and rooms, D and E. Okay. Um, Lafayette is doing one activity in the morning and one activity in the afternoon. Um, and the cleaning is a part of the, the disinfecting and cleaning is a part of that. We think we could do two because in rooms D and E, you can come in the D door and exit out the E door. You don't even have to go in the lobby. So it does have either staff or to Janine's point, a volunteer who has to be willing to take charge. So right now, we, um, our softball players are playing softball, but the league canceled. So they are responsible for managing themselves in a socially distant and, and risk minimizing way. But we are doing golf um, at the golf courses. Megan and Larry or Carrie are there, one of them, every Friday. They're checking people out. They're making sure folks are socially distancing. I mean, it's all of that. It's, it's fairly staff intensive and we probably can't do a lot of activities because of that. Okay. Um, and the fact that Meals on Wheels, we're going to have to really restrict that. If, if Meals on Wheels were to open right now, um, we would have to commit to cleaning the restrooms every 30 minutes, which means we would keep a custodian in the bathroom all day. I mean, it takes 30 minutes to clean and then you'd be doing it again and then you'd be doing it again. It'd be very, very challenging to do anything else. So, um, so with those two, way to measure all that. So with those two, I mean, just given the physical space constraints, is it like 50 people in the building is it 30 people at a given time in the morning and the afternoon between two activities or so we are still under as employees as an organization uh, at 50 percent our city manager wants us organizationally to be 50 percent or teleworking 50 percent okay. here that doesn't mean that i can only have 50 percent of my staff here that's an organizational wide figure, but we're trying to keep to about 50% in the building of staff. 
the other challenge with the number of people in the building, uh, Michelle, is that now employees who have children right. are, are needing to be home with their kids. Right. Um, and so we're trying to work around some of those employee schedule conflicts as well. Okay. So there is a space calculator that the governor's office uh, put out. It is um, fluctuates between six feet of social distance to 12 feet almost. And you have to allow for people to walk in and take a seat, get up and go to the bathroom or get up and leave and not be more than six feet with somebody. Okay. So really and truly the gym or D and E are really our only two spaces that we could even do that with. Mm -hmm. And you really have to tell people when you come in, go to the farthest chair, mm -hmm. unless you're a regular bathroom user, then you need to sit by this chair so you can get up and go and come back. Mm -hmm. It's going to be managing all of that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Michelle does the gym in those two rooms, meeting rooms have out, you know, access to outside ventilation? Do they have windows or doors that can be opened so right. that people aren't in a closed in space? So the uh, rooms, the gym and D&E &E both have an outside door. Um, okay. D&E has windows that can open, but the okay. entire building has a fresh air system that pulls air in. Um, I was on a phone call earlier this week and they are very much discouraging fans inside long-term care facilities. Uh, so we would not be doing that, but we do have fresh air that comes into the building. Okay. So, yeah, Sarah. Well, in terms of planning and programs for after opening, whenever, um, is there a consideration being given to the content to dealing with or helping people deal with the mental health problems of isolation? I, I would have this visual while you were talking earlier about um, would our reopening without um, talking about how you can safely you know, interact with other people and how you should still avoid it. Um, are we encouraging in any way uh, our clientele to act like college kids and go bananas? With no! <laughs> the opportunity to socialize. I, I just think that on the one hand, it, isolation does create some very serious emotional problems and the longer we go, I think they're getting worse. And we should help people figure out how to deal with that without encouraging them to take unsafe risks. Exactly. So there would be a health check at the door. There would be those rules around wearing a mask, staying six feet, hand washing. We have a hand washing station in the lobby and we have hand sanitizer in three different locations, automatic hand sanitizers. Um, so I think that it would not be the college frat party. It would definitely be mindfulness and we would be limiting things, the numbers of people. We're, it's a, um, it's a dilemma um, for sure. Jack. Yeah, is masking gonna be mandatory? Yes. Masking. Yes. The other question I want to present to you is that there's been a study in northern Italy where this COVID viri can attach to air particles and travel long distances. And thinking about our fires, I would kind of keep those windows to a minimum as far as opening them. Just a consideration. Since you do have a air intake system. Right, we do have an air intake system, which not all buildings do, but we do, right? Other thoughts? Do you wanna tell me don't reopen, don't even think about it till January? 
what, what, I mean, I'm curious if what your thoughts are about this, Susan. I want you to reopen as planned, gradually, masked, distance, you know, showing people where to sit, doing the health checks, but at least that would give us some experience and hopefully give people like a hope that life will return to normal. Um, and some contact to see people and interact, even though we have restrictions, it's better than sitting in a Zoom meeting, for instance. So along with Janine, I would be willing to help out staff, escort people in or direct them or whatever you decide you need for an hour or two here or there. And, you know, count me in. I, I would also be happy to volunteer in, in a capacity like that. I do need to share um, Michelle, that I am very torn. I have mixed feelings. Uh, and it isn't a whole lot different than, you know, the conversation about opening up schools. Uh, that we've never experienced this before. And so, you know, whatever we do, we have to do cautiously with the understanding that we may need to backtrack right. if things don't work out. The thing that gives me hesitation is that we are dealing with a group of people that are at higher risk. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, <laughs> I guess that causes me uh, to have a little bit of con you know concern uh, about opening versus not opening, and for some people, certainly the emotional aspects of being isolated have been far more challenging than others. Uh, but I can't say that I'm all for it without consideration. You know, one of the concerns and factors for me about using November is, you know, I don't know where you all live, but certainly here in Old Town, Thompson Park is packed in the, um, as people enjoy the shade and people are social distancing and people are wearing masks and being very mindful. Roosevelt Park, people are using to sit out. I think come November, um, those options, you know, get frozen out. And so watching people being mindful, it'd be, I think that we can do this in a way that we can continue to practice what we've learned and what we're told works, which is masks and social distancing and regular hand washing. And if we can promote that, then the folks who, who have been finding ways to take advantage of the outdoors and the fresh air and whatnot, that we could pr safely provide some options for people. Not for everyone, clearly, but um, we will continue to do the virtual programs, but hopefully we can throw in some mix of things. Art, you've been very quiet today. Do you have any thoughts? Are we uh, about this? Well, uh, just want to let you know I had, uh some prostate cancer last week, so I'm a little, I'm still under, under the weather just a little bit, but I'm doing well, doing very well. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I'm one of these individuals that is extremely cautious, uh, and maybe it was the surgery, I don't know, that got me to that point, but, you know, I know for a fact that there are so many people and uh, that are just lonely, especially if they live alone. It's really difficult for them to get out and they have family members that are continuing coming in maybe to say hello and stuff like this without, uh, how do I want to put it? I don't know that some of the younger people are quite as cautious as we are. 
on, on, on doing these things. So again, I think as long as we follow the, the, the format that you're talking about, being very careful. The one thing I would sure like is that I, I, I understand the first come first serve. And, and I think Jack might allude to this a little bit, but you know, if a person's come in this week already and you have a list, obviously I'm, I'm sure you will be looking at giving everybody that opportunity rather than one person hogging that, that kind of a situation. But I mean, I'm not in a hurry to open, but by the same token, I have a wife here at home who I can communicate with and, and, and there's, there's things like this. But I also have a sister-in-law in Denver who actually had the COVID and was quarantined for 14 days. And she was going crazy. I mean, she used to call my sister, my wife, almost <laughs> crying because she couldn't stand the idea of being alone. Right. So that's just the thing I'm saying is that we try, you know, we try to, first of all, encourage those who are extremely lonely that are living alone to get involved and, and again, make sure that we provide opportunities where they can get in here, well, I don't know, once a week uh, at least, if, if they're wanting to do that, is what, what I'm looking at. Thank you, and thanks for just kind of reconfirming re Jack's point about how and who gets to participate. I appreciate that. And the best to you as you heal, sir. Thank you, but I'm doing well, thank you. Um, how about Susan, then Jack, then Sarah? How's that? Okay, okay. Susan. So if it's first come, first serve, I would like to somehow incorporate um, putting people at the bottom of the list who sign up and then never show up. I mean, that's been a problem right along. You know, you have waiting lists. People don't say, well, I can't make it so that others can, you know, avail themselves of services. That's wow. like a constant problem highlighted by this where restrictions are greater. Yeah. Great point. Thanks. Jack. Yeah. The, uh, Boulder County aging, uh, office has a program where you could call the elderly if you apply for this program and it works out well and I think Jewish Family Services down in Boulder has the same program and I know I'm starting it soon and I think that is helpful it's nice to call people but right. you know I think all of this is dependent upon what the virus does in late October right absolutely yeah Sarah I'd just like to add um, my vote for um, having a system to be sure that everybody gets a fair chance at accessing some of the on site programs. And if that means that individuals are li limited to one shot a week or whatever, whatever, whatever is a fair uh, distribution of access. And I also, I, I'm assuming that we have a contact tracing uh, system set up or that will be part of the program, but we haven't mentioned that. And I think we really need a state-of-the-art um, way to should, you know, in spite of all the um, protections and <clears throat> restrictions, should we find out that there's been some exposure, you know, what do we do about contacting people? Yes, thank you. The registration system would serve for that purpose, but I didn't call it out that way and I will do that. Thanks. Thank you all for your input. You know, it is still an if, 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 if. So um, that's kind of where we're headed. So thank you. Would like to uh, move on to reports. Um, Marcia, any any reports from city council? Um, I think that we should uh, probably acknowledge last night. Anybody not watched council last night? Probably everybody didn't watch council last night. Um, the Longmont Housing Authority, uh, uh, as I think you all know, has fallen on hard times 
and the city is in the process of rescuing it and and Michelle, our own Michelle Waite is uh, one of the rescuers. And I, I was actually almost surprised to see you here at this meeting, Michelle, because it sounds like a, a, a massive undertaking that's, that's uh, um, going on, but uh, we're uh, uh, doing the very important work of keeping what, 600, 800 seniors off the streets. Mm -hmm. How many is it, Michelle? Well, there, there are seven, six senior buildings and they're at about a hundred each. So you're pretty close. Plus the yeah. other buildings also have older adults. Yes. Okay. So a lot of people um, who don't have a lot of resources deeply impacted by this. Um, we had a, a long presentation last night about the progress of the reorganization and uh, it all looks plausible to me. Um, the new sharing of resources looks like a lot of money will be saved uh, in the process. There were many inefficiencies in the you know, 1960s HUD mandated old organization. Um, so I'm, very encouraged by that and I think that the Longmont, uh, the city of Longmont is very privileged to have people on its staff like Michelle, like Harold Dominguez, like Karen and Kathy uh, who have the skill set to do this because because running a housing authority is is a very specialized skill. Um, I think everybody needs a homework assignment which is to tell all your friends that, that the city's rescue operation is, uh, is being done by local heroes and that it is a wonderful thing um, because I'm getting a lot of stupid emails that say, well, why don't you just hire a property manager? We don't want to pay for Harold Dominguez to be working on, to be running the housing authority. He's supposed to be running the city. And, um, you know, that's just so wrong. I don't even know how to charge them in terms of their lifetime mistakes accounts, you know, because, because it is a very specialized thing. And Michelle, you're ducking your head. Are you, are you hating to be praised? Um, <laughs> I, I tell you what, I am, I am learning a lot. And the, you know, the LHA staff that are still here are teaching me a lot. There are some amazing folks who are completely committed to affordable housing. It's a good partnership. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not sure I'm so, so skilled in the whole housing authority rules and regs, but um, I feel like I know people and I know good folks and we have that right now. And I think it's a good, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good place. So and that's, and that's your manager. And that's your manager. Yes. And, and in really, Michelle, that's your role, isn't it, into making, is making sure that the, that the people who live there and aren't sure what's going to happen to them are okay and keeping the communities intact and so on? That's, that's definitely a part of it. And the other is to really support the existing community managers who have not had the tools and the resources and the support, I think, to do all that they want to do. So it's a good partnership. It, and I really, I applaud the city council for, for making this move uh, at the end of May and giving Harold the, the permission and direction to do this. I think it's a good, it's a really good partnership. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would, as, as a personal answerer of emails to council, <laughs> I would really appreciate everybody talking to their friends and saying what uh, an appropriate and special endeavor this is and that it isn't something to complain about. It's really people stepping up when there's a need. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about it. Would, be, would it be appropriate? I thought it was muted. Would it be appropriate for us as a board to... Um, pass a resolution saying that we feel that this is a good development 
and a, a proper use of city staff? I think so. What do you think, Michelle and, Mich and Janine? I like the idea of supporting what you're doing and making a statement about that, both, you know, to the city council itself and maybe even, you know, to the newspaper. Yeah, do a press release. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with contacting the press. You know, maybe having something like that, maybe having an article about what you're doing and why you've done it and the successes uh, might take away some of that question mark for people in the community. So I would rather not be the focus of that. I think um, if you as a board want to support city council's direction uh, with Longmont Housing Authority, especially in recognition of the number of properties that they own that are geared for older adults, uh, sure. But I don't, I think it's really important not to single out any one staff person um, or any one thing. It, um, this is something that council agreed to do and Harold is leading uh, in terms of the city staff and then the LHA staff are also a very much a key part of this. So I would not, I would not want to be singled out in any way, shape or form. I'd never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do we need to make a motion for that? I think we do, and I would welcome suggestions about how to word such a resolution. So if somebody could put some thought into that and, and um, I just like to point out that in terms of the staffs, both staffs, it's a ripple effect, you know, that when when the leadership steps up, then the people who work for the leadership steps up and, you know, there's probably very few people that are not touched in some way, whether it's, uh, you know, just, I mean, people outdoor working have to take the initiative more because their boss is, is supporting somebody else. And so it is really the entire city that's making an effort and the, um, you know, and the LHA staff and the uh, the two boards, everybody has has is contributing something extra uh, in this uh, in this effort. So, um, I uh, um, I just want to make sure that that's in there. Does anyone have any suggestions for Sarah in terms of wording? I'm not good at that, frankly, or I give my input, Sarah. Well, I've gotten some ideas from the last two folks who commented there, but... Um, it's hard to do this on a fly. Can, can, can we do emails or is that a sunshine law violation? Somebody write a draft. I think you can, you can't vote through emails. Um, right. But I think it can be simple. If what you're saying, Sarah, is that you support the direction city council has laid out, with uh, the relationship between the city of Longmont and Longmont Housing Authority, it can be as simple as that, that you support this direction and recognize that, it's, that it has some positive uh, support for the older adults who live in those communities. It can be very simple. Um, and apparently cost saving. Apparently what? Cost saving. And end with thank you. Well, 
Can I make a motion that um, the Senior Advisory Board um, acknowledge uh, the community and council for work that they have done uh, with Longmont Housing Authority? I mean, I think that's fine if, and then the board can choose to second and vote and see where that goes okay do i hear a second i second that okay all those in favor signify by raising their hand please any opposed and sarah can we have you put that together for us? Um, yes. And before okay. we submit it to the, the council, I'll be sure that everybody gets a copy of the wording and, and, and say, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can't vote, but there's but there's no harm in seeing it in advance. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on to any reports, Sarah. Any further reporting uh, from AAC? Well, <clears throat> clearly the reframing project is taking quite a bit of our time and energy. Um, but also, this Friday's meeting uh, will include a panel discussion on housing issues uh, with representatives from Longmont, from Boulder County, and um, I think, although I don't have that right before me, um, several other um, government entities that are involved with senior population and housing issues. So Sarah, who's going to do that from Longmont? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> well, I will have to go out of uh, Zoom and look at the email to give you that name. I can't tell you right offhand. I, I'm curious about that. If you could send me that. I will. Thank you. Um, also, the last meeting was devoted in part to a uh, report on the budget situation because uh, the Area Aging Council has a technical review committee that does all of the nuts and bolts work on uh, reviewing applications for funding, um, making recommendations to commissioners about what things should be funded, and <clears throat> also monitoring uh, Clients with the grantees. So that's an important thing. Um, the fiscal year for AAA has been amended or extended for two months. So the new, the upcoming fiscal year, which is being funded by the current review, uh, will be shortened. Um, and the only other significant thing about that is that the recommendation is that the nutrition uh, or uh, support for access to adequate food, that that line item will be increased for obvious reasons. Um, I think that's it for now. And I'll get you that name, Michelle. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Susan, uh, report on friends. Yes, well, they met last week and they're in the process of uh, accounting for all checks written so that all monies will be at its great Western now. Uh, it's been several months trying to transfer all of their assets there because Jean 
Cox, the co-treasurer of the Fed Friends, as the investment advisor for the Friends. Um, they're also working on redoing their board manual. They have many new members and they just lost one. So there's an opening on that board for another member. And they're also working on their annual campaign and best way to approach it in light of the whole COVID situation. But the great thing that I didn't realize how it worked, they've got an investment portfolio of over $2 million. They have helped to fund many of the continuing education mm -hmm. programs and they've reassign some monies as needed, directing it to COVID needs. And they're tracking that. So not spending as much for the senior center, but money is there should we need it to start up again or whatever, they're there. Um, Michelle, uh, any report from TRG? No, ma'am. There's nothing. I think our next scheduled meeting might have gotten pushed out to November, but I'm not. I'm not sure. But nothing between last time and this time. All right. And Art, anything from uh, Boulder County Latino Coalition? Uh, Longmont Economic Development Partnership is um, currently uh, quarterly. I believe the next meeting is next month, not this month. And Jack, any additional things for uh, sustainability? Yeah, let me mention something that took place at the state meeting at the energy office. They spoke about uh, natural and human greenhouse gases increasing, which is going to affect what's happening around our globe, unfortunately. Uh, which communities are affected? A roadmap to 100% renewable energy by 2040 with bold climate action, hopefully. And uh, a call to action to decrease uh, pollutants. And what the state will be doing is uh, redoing their vehicle pool uh, by increasing electric vehicles, sedans, trucks, heavy equipment, uh, changing some of the building codes and trying to use uh, things that have extreme efficiency when it comes to appliances. They discuss House Bill 1261, which has an impact on increasing uh, impacts on uh, uses of uh, HFCs and their rules, which is uh, hydrofluorocarbons, which, in, which decreases uh, the uh, emissions of, that are harmful to our uh, environment. They talked about 2030 goals, clean electricity, energy efficiency, building and industrial electrification, they talked about advanced biofuels, oil and gas, and part of this uh, house bill, I think it might be house or and I thought it was the house, which increases uh, inspectors for fracking sites. And I don't know if folks know, there are 50,000 fracking sites just in the county of Weld and unfortunately that helps to increase what I call the crescent of uh, ozone that comes from Weld and goes all the way up to the Boulder Reservoir. 
and unfortunately it impacts the elderly as well as some ch children with asthma and other uh, health infirmities. Um, so it's important that we do something about what's going on all over the globe, especially here in Colorado. They're talking about um, having increased inspectors. And an important part of this is oil and gas has to be more aware of what they do incorrectly because they've made large increases in fines with non-compliance at fracking sites. They talk about agriculture, coal usage, and waste management. And that was about it. Jack, I have a, a question. You sure. may or may not know this. Um, what, you know, what supersedes the state? Like I know Well County kind of has their own rules and regulations and given that they're the county that happens to also have the largest number of fracked wells. Uh, do their rules and regulations um, supersede those of the state? There's a hierarchy. Unfortunately, the feds haven't done very much when it comes to fracking. And as we all know, it all depends. It all boils down to big corporations making big money out of this stuff. And the sad part is most of that fracking gas and oil is exported because they make more money. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the state Supreme Court overruled some of the fracking rules which said that there would not be any fracking within certain counties or the state. So that put a kibosh on certain things and here in Longmont, you know, we had on the ballot a couple of years ago to keep fracking out of the city limits. But unfortunately, with the ruling from the state Supreme Court, they said that they could frack, but the point is they could be fracking at the city limits, but they go horizontally. Right. And we're not sure if we can check all the casings that go under the city. And we have some right outside. We live two miles. We're at 17th and Pace. And we live two miles from a fracking site. And unfortunately, people are unaware of health impacts because I've listened, listened to some pediatricians. And they talk about certain children having asthma and nosebleeds and inc increased problems from all the, shall I say, uh, pollutants that come out of a a fracking site, and some of which are carcinogenic, benzene, ethylene, and things such as that. And there's also flaring because of the excess methane that's exposed into the environment. You know, and as we all know, global warming is a serious problem from anything from coral reefs disappearing in Australia, uh, Key West, and so many other places. And the other problem is, look at all the serious problems we've had with hurricanes, and just look at the category four that we just had hit Louisiana and uh, Texas. And unfortunately, the federal level isn't doing as much as they could be doing to decrease global warming and increasing uh, natural ways of producing power, like uh, wind energy and solar energy because the old excuse they used, they couldn't store it, but the new storing capacities have very much increased over the last year or two. So that, that basically means we can uh, make recommendations as the state can make recommendations, but at this particular point in time, uh, cannot mandate no, oil and gas has a lot of clout in our state, unfortunately. Okay. And I think Governor Polis has uh, done a better job than most in the past as far as keeping oil and gas within rain. But, uh, you know, it's big money, and unfortunately, oil and gas is a big oil maker for the state because we get tax uh, monies from them. And uh, 
it's a problem, but I think health should be more important than making profits, unfortunately. But you know, it's like the old tobacco industry. Physicians and their scientists said that smoking wasn't injurious to your health. But we all know the results of that and states receive billions of dollars from the tobacco industry, but people are still smoking. But oil and gas and fracking is a problem for this state and it's injurious to one's health. I think Janine, uh, Marsha wanted to weigh in on that. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say that, that uh, uh, there is lo there's local control as of the legislature but one, the last legislature, but one um, did pass uh, a resolution that changed the ma mission of the COGCC to include safeguarding health and, and, and gave that primacy um, over fostering the oil and gas industry um, and also gave the right to uh, make local re regulations as long as they are more strict, not less strict, than the state regulations. Weld County is um, upset about that um, because they wanted to unregulate. They wanted, they wanted to repeal the, the new state regulations and let the oil and gas industry what, keep doing what they're doing. And given that there's not a lot of, of enforcement mechanisms in place, they're essentially doing that, essentially just by looking the other way. Um, the other thing is that, the, uh, you know, with legislation, um, it changes what the regulatory agencies have the right and mandate to do, but then the regulatory agencies have to do what's called rulemaking to put actionable guidelines in place. And they have been really dragging their feet on that. Um, so despite having new members who are not part of the oil and gas industry, the COGCC and the Air Quality Organization um, have, have just not uh, stepped up to the plate yet in terms of, of really making changes that can be acted upon to clean up the oil and gas industry. Uh, um, <clears throat> the other thing that's, that's probably relevant to this is that uh, our Longmont and what's the other organization? Is it, Jack, you might know this, is it Colorado Rising? Um, that's one of them. Yeah, they're, they are suing the city of Longmont uh, to um, establish a precedent that cities may uh, in fact ban fracking. So that they're, they're also suing um, the COGCC who needs and, and to, to um, reinstate Longmont's fracking ban as law. Uh, and uh, um, I mean, Longmont doesn't really, the way things are now, have anything in the enforcement action that it could do it would have to sue somebody outside the city limits and it's then there'd be a whole new thing about whether Longmont has stat has standing to sue. Um, but anyway, um, uh, those environmental organizations are trying to sue Longmont and if they win their suit, it would establish a precedent that uh, uh, fracking bans are part of what is now allowed by law. Um, that, you know, it, it would essentially over, if they won the suit, then it would go to the Supreme Court again, but the Supreme Court would have the chance to reinstate Longmont's fracking ban. Do we think that's going to happen? Uh, no, I don't. And I also hope it doesn't because uh, I don't think it's, you know, the people of Longmont paid a lot uh, in terms of expended tax money. Um, to do all the things we've done to fight fracking. And uh, although there is some drilling underneath Union Reservoir now, mm -hmm. the points of entry are the 2,500 feet 
outside the Longmont city limits, which is supposedly the radius of worst harm in terms of, you know, stillborn babies and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I hope that Longmont does not have to pay again for that. Um, you know, I think that somebody who has a current problem like Broomfield or, or Erie ought to be um, bearing the burden um, I also, my, the legal consultants that I have turned to, uh, don't think that it has a very good chance of prevailing that lawsuit, but it's, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, the country of fans and uh, Bulgaria banned fracking in their countries. So did the state of New York. I don't think it's any, I don't think there's any question that it's a, a terrible practice that shouldn't be done. Um, it's just... You know, you can drill a well without, you know, horizontal, you know, fracking as well. Plus the other problem is each fracking site uses uh, three to five million gallons of water and we can't afford that water. Just look at what's happening to the Colorado River. Its biome is going down precipitously, unfortunately. Yeah. And with global warming, we can't depend on the mountains to, you know, for the uh, spring melt off for our great water supply that we have in uh, Longmont. It's one of the best. It is, and fortunately it's one of the best, partly because a lot of it comes from the Eastern Slope basins. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, of, of all the cities in the Front Range, I think that we're the best fixed for water. And, you, you know, where I spend my efforts as an activist is try to destroy the market for fossil fuels. Absolutely. <laughs> but the other thing, Marsha, is that, uh, that the legislative bill, 1261, yeah. did increase inspectors and really raised the fines for, uh, you know, not doing what they're supposed to be doing with their fracking sites. Well, that's the deal, you know, it has to be, uh, it has to be uh, the rule makings and money appropriations that have to do that. So 1261 right now as it stands doesn't have enough teeth. Um, that's actually why we are, Longmont is retaining Dr. Helmick um, mm -hmm. because we hope someday to be able to use his measurements to sue somebody right? Weld County oh, for allowing this stuff, the COGCC ah. for not having teeth, all that. So we're, we're, tr we're trying our best and we're already spending a lot more money to do it. But it's a problem for your health. That's, this, that's yes. the important part. Mm -hmm. okay. That's it, Michelle. <laughs> all right. Sorry. Um, Sarah, do you have any additional things to add about the census complete count committee? No. Sarah said no. Oh. No. Okay. All right. Janine, um, Janine, I do have a couple of things I'd like to share if I could real quick. Yep, you can. So it is my understanding that Longmont United Hospital has closed their Center for Health uh, and Integrative Medicine, CHIM. And I don't know what that means for us. That has been our primary contact uh, with Longmont United Hospital with the presence here at the Senior Center, uh, pre-COVID anyways. But um, we've had their massage therapists, their acupuncturists, their nurses, and, and other great staff who have been here at the Senior Center. So I just found this out yesterday and I don't have a lot of update what that means in our relationship uh, between the Longmont Senior Center and Longmont United Hospital, but I will be finding that out in the days ahead. Uh, Susan, did you have a comment about that? Some of us have outstanding gift cards with right. quite a bit of money on them. I mean, are they gonna announce it? Are they gonna send checks? What are they doing? Yeah, I haven't heard that yet, um, but that is one of the things on my list. Thank you. 
Jack. Jack. Yeah, the person that did the uh, acupuncture has left the area, I think. Right, right. She was terrific. The other announcement uh, that I wanted to make is that I applied for funding through Boulder County Area Agency on Aging. We have had a long-term partnership with them to uh, deliver um, some specific programs in Longmont, the short-term assistance program, the respite assistance program, choices at home program, et cetera. Um, and so I will be meeting with them later this afternoon. We will are hoping rather than doing individual memorandums of understanding between the city of Longmont Senior Services and Boulder County Area Agency on Aging, we can do one larger memorandum of understanding. And um, at this point, I've asked for the funds, which is about $27,000 to go to the Friends of the Senior Center, uh, rather to the city, because I'd get a quicker turnaround time <laughs> in writing checks. But uh, anyways, I'll be, uh, I'll be working on that. And I'm very excited to move this to that to that place. So I did want to share those two things real quick. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have no public invited to be heard. Uh, does anyone else have anything else? Sarah? I had a question from Michelle regarding when you mentioned the um, health services that have been provided by Integrative Health. Uh, has there been any uh, more action about uh, the foot care uh, RFP? Yeah, we have put all of that on hold, though I understand Boulder County Public Health did let Lafayette open up their foot care. So anyways, those have all sort of been put on hold until we figure out when we're reopening. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have uh, other business? I'd like to hear a motion to adjourn our meeting. I'll make that motion. I'll second and it. Second it by Susan. Okay. Well, I thank you all very much for your participation today and it's really wonderful to see you and to be with you even if it is on a screen uh, and look forward to seeing you all next month thank you hi everybody bye bye, -bye.